Oh, what a weekend it was. We'll recap the fireworks down in Bloomington, give a look at our quarterly concerns for Ball State, and we'll take a look at this weekend's matchup as the Bulls come running into Muncie. Third down trip starts right now. Ball State Sports Link's third down chirp is delivered by Papa John's. Better ingredients, better pizza. Visit PapaJohns.com today for more info. Hello and welcome into another exciting week of third down chirps delivered by Papa John's. I'm your host, Chris Rankle, alongside Pat Boylan and Timmy Fogarty, guys. It's been almost a week now since the IU game, and all I can say is, wow. Yeah, and, and think about this. For fifth-year seniors on the football team, they beat IU three times. But you're exactly right. I, beating IU, it never gets old, although I wish they could have done it and also kept my blood pressure a little lower. Going down to Bloomington and able to get a win like that, guys, just makes it that much sweeter walking around the stadium after the game and just saying chirp, chirp for all the Ball State fans. And it's still fun to watch almost a week later the fireworks down in Bloomington. Ball State in Indiana down in Bloomington for the second year in a row. Early on, Indiana would go up 3 nothing, but Jawan Edwards putting the Cardinals back on top with another classic up the middle touchdown run. Cardinals lead 7-3. The Ball State offense just getting started. Keith winning Zane Fakes first touchdown of the year. And Zane Fakes would have another touchdown catch in this game. You'll see it later on. And Keith Wenning just getting started. This time up top, Willie Sneed beats his defender, and all that's left is a touchdown. Sneed makes a great move off the line, beats his defender, and makes a fabulous touchdown catch. The Ball State offense just rolling in this one. Jamil Smith, it's a run. No wait, it's a pass, and there's the receiver, Keith Wenning. What a catch. What a perfectly executed play. Wenning was never open at any point, and Jamil delivers a perfect ball. And then Wenning getting back to his passing ways. He's going to find Zane Fakes for his second touchdown of the game. Zane Fakes, two touchdowns for the first time in his career. But IU would come storming back. Shane Wynn with the touchdown in the last couple minutes to put IU up 39-38. The Ball State offense would have one more chance. Here's Wenning to Willie Sneed. Is he in? The referees say yes. That sets up the Stephen Schott field goal. Devonta to hold, the snap is there, it's down, the kick is up, it's on the way, it's got the leg, and it is good! It's good! It's good! It's good! Steven Schutt puts wow. it through, and he's beaten Indiana on the last second! Steven Schutt is a hero! Wow! Oh my! 41-39, a last second field goal! Ball State is going absolutely nuts on the field! And when the dust settled, Ball State comes out victorious, 41-39, a last-second victory for the Cardinals. Keith Wenning finally having the game. We thought he could, 222 yards passing, three touchdowns. Jawan Edwards limited a little bit, but still 78 yards on the ground and another score. And a bit surprising to see out of the three games that this be the one that Jawan Edwards struggled the most in, but still, the Ball State rushing attack still rushed for over 200 yards. I think one of the biggest things, guys, was just the balanced attack of Ball State. You know, Keith Winning finally came out and played up to his potential that everyone knew uh, that he could play like this season with 223 yards th uh, through the air, three touchdowns. Edwards only 78 yards, but did a good job holding onto the football, controlling the game. So Ball State really offensively extremely balanced in this one. Now a huge win for the Cardinals and for player of the game, it's kind of obvious you give it to Steven Schott, but even though Schott got all the glory at the end, which is weird to say for a kicker, uh, there were a lot of guys who contributed to this win. Yeah, I think Steven Schott's the obvious answer, so we're going to pick a couple different names. For me, it's going to be Willie Sneed. And outside of that Steven Schott kick, what are the two biggest plays of the game? At least for Ball State, you can make an argument. It was Willie Sneed's deep touchdown grab uh, right before half, and then you could also make an argument that it was his diving catch right before the end of the game, which set up instead of Ball State having to take a 59 yard dream field goal they got us they got it set up with a 42 yard kick and if you've seen replays of that catch by Willie Sneed it is a tremendous catch so I'll go with the sophomore wide receiver. Sneed an absolute fabulous game from him I'm gonna go from the guy who threw him the football Keith winning winning on the day three touchdowns and the most important stat guys zero interceptions he held on to the football he didn't try to force anything throw any dumb passes he did exactly what coach Skrowski wants him to do manage the game 
game. He's not going to put up, you know, 500 yards passing. He's going to put up his 200 yards, some yards passing, a couple of touchdowns. So for me, the player of the game has to be Keith Winning. Now this is the second year in a row Ball State and Indiana have met in the regular season and it's also the second year in a row that this game has come down to one big play. Last year it was Connor Ryan's toe touch in the back of the end zone and of course last weekend it was Steven Schott's last second field goal. So Pat, you know, there are people who say that this isn't really a rivalry, but it's really kind of starting to feel like one. Could you consider it an official rivalry? I think it has to be a rivalry. You've got two Division I FBS schools in the same state. The season series overall is 4-3. to three. IU won the first four. Ball State's won the last three. And you hear Jamil Smith talk about how fun it is for little brother to beat big brother. Well, I've got two younger, younger brothers, and you know how awful it is when you're an older brother to lose to little brother. So at the same point, IU's got to be sick of losing. Now, unfortunately, this series comes to a halt for a little bit. We have a few years. There's one more scheduled in Bloomington down the road, uh, but I definitely think that this one has blossomed into a rivalry now that Ball State struck back and taken the last three. Oh, I agree. The three wins with Ball State, you know, the, in 2008, last year, and this season are huge for the, them to call this a rivalry. And now, guys, with the last three wins, that opens up a whole new door as far as recruiting in the state of Indiana goes because IU usually, you know, would be able to get those guys who say, oh, okay, you have offers from Ball State or IU. Well, we're a Big Ten school. Now it's a whole new story. Ball State's knocked them off the last three times, so they could have offers from IU and Ball State. Well, you could go to IU, Coach Limbo could say, but we beat them the last three years. So, you know, I think it absolutely is considered a rivalry, especially the last three wins have been huge for that. For the sake of the show, we're going to call it a rivalry. And Ball State and Indiana weren't the only rivalry game going on this past weekend as we take a look around the MAC presented by Fox College Sports. Starting in the MAC East, Ohio and Marshall, the Bobcats just edge one out in their game for the Bell 27-24. It's a MAC team versus a former MAC team. Marshall historically has won this one, but Ohio improves to 3-0 with the victory. The battle of I-75, Toledo and Bowling Green. The Rockets come out strong, 27-15 victors. Toledo preseason, one of the better teams in the MAC, goes ahead and proves it here, 12-point win over Bowling Green. Over in the MAC West, Minnesota and Western Michigan, the Golden Gophers get the win, 28-23. And Western Michigan knocked out Marquise Gray, the starting quarterback of Minnesota, but still could not edge out the victory. Northern Illinois just squeaks by the Army Black Knights, 41-40, two teams Ball State's going to see later on in the season. This a high score game could later in the year play in Ball State's favor if it is a shootout like this one. Now in the max standings for the third straight week, Ball State fans get excited. Your Cardinals are at top of the Mid-American Conference, 2-1 overall record, 1-0 in the conference. And both of those are important. First of all, you want to be at the top of your conference and hopefully competing for a MAC championship, but also you're looking for a bowl game. So the fact that Ball State has those two wins, they're third the way there. Now it's hard to believe that the season's already one-fourth of the way done and we've really seen enough of this team to make an educated uh, response to this question, but what are your quarter concerns so far for Ball State? Well, for me, it's been closing out football games and a lot of that rests on the defense, but you go to the first game of the year against Eastern Michigan. Ball State's up 37-13. to They're winning in a blowout. Eastern Michigan puts up 13 points. All of a sudden, it's 37-26 and they're driving late in the game. Now, that game wasn't ever really too much in doubt, but the Indiana game definitely was was a 13 point lead and the ball with four minutes left. IU comes back, scores two touchdowns, and you need a last second field goal. Ball State's got to get this short up defensively because we've seen how the Mid-American Conference works. It seems like almost every other week is coming down to the wire, and if you're not closing well, Ball State's going to find themselves on the short end of a lot of close games. My concern's kind of in that same category. Mine's in the secondary, though. I'm going to focus on the secondary just because they're giving up 327 yards a game through the air. It's really tough to win a lot. Luckily, right now, you know, they're 2-1. and one. But it's going to be really tough in the MAC to win a lot of games if you're giving up that many yards through the air against some good MAC teams. And another thing, zero interceptions this season in the secondary. So really, so far through three games this year, I think the number one concern for getting better has to be the secondary in general. Luckily, there's still three quarters of the season left to go, so a lot of good football and a lot of time to fix those things that we are concerned about. And one guy that we're not concerned about is that fifth year kicker with nerves of platinum, Steven Schott. Here's an upcoming look at a SportsLink feature kicking under pressure by Brad Daly and myself that shows that Steven Schott can handle the pressures of kicking at the Division I level, and it all stems back to where he's from. Take a look. Devonta to hold the snap is there, it's down, the kick is up, it's on, on the way, it's got the leg, and it is good! It's good! It's good! It's good! Steven Schott is a hero! 
In just two years as the starting kicker, Ball State senior Steven Schott has become known for making game-winning kicks. While other players crumble under the pressure, Schott thrives when the game is on the line. And his ability to handle that pressure all goes back to where he grew up, in Massillon, Ohio. The whole town, you know, is all focused on football all the time. For that 10 to 15 weeks out of the year, you know, the town just goes crazy. There's signs up in all the buildings, you know, the players have their pictures up on local businesses. And, um, you know, growing up, it's like, it's, you know, it's life, life or death. My dad pretty much laid it down to my mom, you know, how it's going to be. Like, there's going to be people who are going to hate him. You know, there's going to be people who are going to, you know, send messages to him and, and, you know, have that bad blood towards him. Just growing up, I've always just, you know, I've loved that. I've loved the pressure that's always been on me as, like, you know, as a player. To see the full story, be sure to look for our feature, Kicking Under Pressure, the Stephen Schott story, coming soon only to Ball State Sports Link. Now, in sports, it's called the 24-hour rule. You enjoy the win for 24 hours, and then it's on to the next one. And the next one for Ball State is going to be a tough matchup as the South Florida Bulls make their trip to Muncie for the first time in program history. And we take a look at these two teams closer in our head-to-head -head segment, starting with the quarterback position, really the featured matchup between Keith Wenning and B.J. Daniels. It really is the featured matchup of this game. Daniels, the scrambler, Wenning, the pocket quarterback. This will be already the third scrambling quarterback that Ball State has faced in four games. Winning, like you said, more of a pocket passer. His completion percentage a little bit higher. Daniel struggles to throw on the run, so Ball State hopefully can get him outside the pocket and force him into some bad decisions. At the running back position, really been the strength for Ball State, and maybe the X factor for the Cardinals offense, but really a weakness for South Florida. And this is where if Ball State has an edge, it's right here in Jawan Edwards, who actually had a pretty good game running the football at South Florida last year. It's just they got down too far too early. If Ball State wants some success, they're going to have to run the ball well. Juan Edwards, 110 yards a game. Another guy who's not even mentioned, Horatio Banks, he brings in 70 yards a game. So I agree with Pat. I think if there's an edge, uh, Ball State has it in the running back category. At the wide receiver position, really the Ball State receivers starting to emerge, but South Florida, a very strong group of receivers. Sneed star is starting to emerge, but they've been incredibly balanced, at least uh, one through three. If Willie Sneed catches the first pass of the USF game, he, Connor Ryan, and Jamil Smith will all be at 17 receptions. And the secondary for Ball State, like I mentioned, might have some problems with this guy, Andre Davis, an absolute monster uh, at receiver for South Florida, just shy of 100 yards a game, coming in at 96. Defensively, an area of concern for both teams, uh, both defenses coming off shaky performances. I think if you're South Florida, though, you're a little more confident in your unit than Ball State is coming in. Look at that third down conversion percentage for South Florida's defense. At 30%, that's a terrific number, and that's something that Ball State really prounds themselves in as well. At 48%, that's going to need to go down. Another stat for the Bulls that's important is the nine sacks on the season. They've got some very quick guys on the outside coming off the edge. Could raise some problems for winning in the wideouts. And we talked to several players after practice this week about taking on the tough task of the South Florida Bulls. They're just really fast, obviously. Uh, they're not as big as Clemson and Long, but they're a lot more, uh, they're physical and fast. So, and playing them last year, I think, uh, is going to give us a big advantage in knowing how they play and it's going to help us out this week. A lot of speed, obviously. That's what our whole team is about speed. So, uh, I think our, we're more physical type of team. So, it'll be interesting to see how that matchup goes. Clemson had a fast tempo and USF has, has a fast tempo and IU had a fast tempo, but Clemson really had a fast tempo and we've been practicing it a lot by um, doing hurry up and blitz fast and stuff to get us in better shape and with the DBs and all the other um, defensive players we've been running out to practice to, to get in better shape. We've been watching film so hopefully um, we know a route they run in like certain, certain situations so you know BJ Daniels if he throw the ball, you know, he's, we, we just got to make a play. And we talked a little bit about the South Florida quarterback, B.J. Daniels, in our head-to-head -head segment. He's a guy that really the face of the South Florida team and the entire offense runs through him. He kind of dictates where the game's going to go for the Bulls. Absolutely torched Ball State last year. They had no answer to stop him. So now that he's coming back to Muncie, that brings up the question yet again, Pat, how do you stop this guy? Well, it's the biggest key of the game, and he reminds me a little bit of Taj Boyd, the quarterback from Clemson. He's a little bit quicker, will run a little bit more, but in the case of both, if you give him time to throw and you give him time back there to make decisions, he's going to be able to torch you. If you can get in the face of him, not necessarily getting sacks every time, but make him make quick throws, he's been prone to throw some interceptions. I think if Ball State can consistently get pressure on this guy, they don't always have to take him down, but if they can get pressure on him, force him into a couple bad mistakes, the Cardinals still 
still looking for turnover number one, at least uh, from an interception standpoint. Pat, I think this is along the same lines as getting, you know, getting a guy in his face. Is when he gets outside the pocket, you've got to hit him in the mouth. You've got to have guys like Tony Martin and Travis Freeman come up and just put a lick on him. So every time he hits the ground, he's saying, I don't want to run outside the pocket. Those guys are smashing me every time I get out there. So I think in the first quarter, you really need to let him know. When he runs the football, hit him, you know, give him a lick. So he gets up off the ground and just, man, I don't want the ball in my hands anymore. So he tries to get it out quicker, forcing mistakes. So I think that's really how you stop B.J. Daniels in this situation. A very tough task ahead for the Ball State defense. We asked Jonathan Newsom and Eric Patterson this exact question after practice. We want to make sure that uh, he's handing that run, that he's handing that ball off to those running backs, that he doesn't, you know, get to make plays with his feet. He's a pretty good player. Uh, he probably make anybody on our team miss as far as open field goes. So we'll try to keep him in the pocket, make you know, force him into some bad decisions. They're a big running team. They got a lot of good athletes. They got a big offensive line. So far, I think, uh, I think um, it's a big challenge for our defense just to go out there and make a statement. Uh, you know, this is a big game. It's a big challenge. So I mean, they like to run the ball. We, we do a pretty good job stopping the run. That's why we're going to go ahead and force him to throw the ball. And that's what we want them to do. We want them to throw the ball. Bless him. Bless him, man. If, if, if we get pass rush, he just, he just throws the ball up. So hopefully we, we get a nice blitz this week. We got uh, Jay Newback and Nick Miles and, you know, Nate and Don. So hopefully get a, we get a good pass rush. Now, so many players had great performances against Indiana. So, Pat, who's going to be your player to watch this week? For me, it's the defensive end who played in his first game in about two years last week against Indiana, Jonathan Newsom. He got credited with two sacks. One, he ran the IU quarterback out of bounds one yard behind the line of scrimmage. But the other one, a legit sack on Cameron Kaufman. And he's a guy who, if he can create pressure by himself, can really make a difference in this Ball State defense. Mine's going to be on the offensive side of the ball, guys. Like we mentioned earlier, this USF team is vulnerable against the run. They give up 158 yards a game. Ball State puts uh, 262 yards a game on the ground and Juwan Edwards 78 in a touchdown last game, 110 yards a game this year. So I think my player is Juwan Edwards and I think on the ground Ball State can really make uh, some problems for South Florida. Now, as many as good performances as there were, there were still some areas of concern. So, Pat, who do you really look for to improve? For me, the glaring problem is in the defensive backfield, and I don't think that's really a secret. If I had to pick one player, and it's really hard to pick on one player for all of this, I'm going to go with Jared Swaby just because he's the veteran of the group, and he was also in on the play where IU had a touchdown when they were down 13 with four minutes to go, a, a big breakdown in defensive coverage uh, where they threw for a touchdown with four minutes left and really enabled that IU comeback. Jared Swabby's the kind of guy who prides himself in being a playmaker. The Cardinals still with zero interceptions on the season. I'd like to see him make one or two against South Florida. Pat, I'm also going to be on the defensive side of the ball, but I'm going to go with the big boys down low. I'm going to go with the defensive line. So far this season, only four sacks on the year. Uh, against a bigger Clemson offensive line a couple games ago. They really struggled uh, to get a push against those guys. So with the South Florida O-line, also a big group, I really think that the Ball State defensive line has to improve. Jonathan Newsom has to create some uh, noise off the edge. And like we've been saying all game, create turnovers and make B.J. Daniels throw bad footballs. And finally, guys, what are going to be your keys to the game? Well, we talked earlier the key to getting pressure on B.J. Daniels and the key to stopping B.J. Daniels and getting pressure on him. That's also my key to the game is if you give B.J. Daniels time to sit back there, he's going to pick you apart. The defensive front four has got to get pressure on him, and they've got to be able to do it without needing the linebackers very often. You can blitz here or there, uh, but you need your linebackers back in coverage. First of all, if a linebacker misses on a blitz, B.J. Daniels can torture with his legs. And, and if the offensive line picks it up or Daniels has just a second, if the linebackers have to blitz, he can beat you with his arm. So the front four really needs to get pressure and allow those linebackers to go back into coverage. I think if they do that, they really stand a chance. We've seen how mistake prone B.J. Daniels can be if you get some pressure on him. When you play big name teams, you have to make big plays. So I think for me, it's going to be creating turnovers. This Ball State defense has to force Daniels into bad situations, and the offense has to limit their turnovers. Juwan needs to hang on to the football, and Keith needs to do exactly what he did last week. Guys, zero picks last week, and we all noticed that we were at the game. The offense was really clicking. They were really smooth. So I think the biggest thing for Ball State is to create turnovers, make big plays, and really obviously limit their own turnovers. And one of the guys that everyone loves to watch, he doesn't really need to improve all that much, and he's a key to the Ball State success, is wide receiver Jamil Smith. He does a little bit of everything. He can throw, he can run, he can catch the ball, and he returns kicks. Joe Saylor and Pat Boylan give us a closer look at one of the most electric and smallest players in Division I football. Ball State wide receiver Jamil Smith has been called a lot of things. 
too short, too small, not a Division I athlete. And in his battle to prove all of those labels wrong, he's earned a new one, hometown hero. Um, Indiana basketball state and Muncie, all they did was play basketball. So I, I played basketball with my friends. I actually got involved in football in Indianapolis. I uh, lived in Indianapolis uh, fourth grade year with my mother. And, uh, she got me into football and then from there on, I just been playing my whole life. And as Jamil progressed in football, he continued to catch coaches' eyes. So much so that they named him the starting quarterback at Muncie Southside High School as a sophomore. All, all the way through middle school, we had a, we watched uh, Southside play and uh, we did their offense. So I did I played quarterback in seventh grade, so it all transferred when I got here. People think I'm always a, a running quarterback, but I was actually a dual threat quarterback. I do just as many times as I ran the ball. I preferred to pass the ball. Smith shattered school records in passing and rushing, but his size limited his recruitment. So without a scholarship offer, the choice for Smith was clear. The school right down the road. I always wanted to play college football. Being close to home, my senior year, um, I, a couple of members of my family here, um, no, I didn't have any offers either, so, so I wanted to stay as a hometown guy and try to uh, get ball set as good as we could be. For Jamil to make the jump from high school football to collegiate football, he first needed to make a switch from quarterback to wide receiver. I had to learn how to run routes uh, perfect, how, how to look at defenses, know what the corner is doing. So it was, a, it was a hard adjustment. The biggest challenge was just getting my shot because, you know, they have scholarship players that they have to uh, try to use. So uh, getting an opportunity was one of the biggest challenges. Faye Jamil Smith, outstanding catch, touchdown, Ball State. As a coach, you love to have ex-quarterbacks in your program. I remember years ago back at Lehigh, we had 16 ex-quarterbacks playing for us in all kinds of different positions, from safety to outside linebacker to tight end to wide receiver. Uh, Jamil is a guy that's had responsibility put on his shoulders before. He's had to be a leader. He's had to be vocal. And now you take all of those traits and you move it to the receiver position. He has a good understanding not only of his own role within the offense, but everything else that's going on around him. At five foot eight and 138 pounds, Smith is the smallest player in Division I football, something he feels actually helps him. I know what you are, I know what you aren't, so I use to what I am, small, quick, agile, to my advantage. When they first turn on the film, and they see his size, they're probably not overly concerned, but the more you watch, it's hard not to respect his productivity and the success that he's had so far this year. I know everybody, I can always remember everybody that says something negative towards me about my size and what exactly they said. I know exactly what everybody said. As Jamil enters his junior season, he's even more focused to make his goals a reality. As a team, I wanted to win the MAC championship, go to bowl games. Like after our games, I have a lot of people from the Boys and Girls Club coming up to me, shake, uh, shaking my hand. I know all of them. Um, a lot of people from just where I'm from in Muncie. So I love it. I love it. For Ball State Sports Link, I'm Pat Boylan. It's now time for a What's Chirping Question of the Week. You can tweet a question to us at Third Down Chirp or hashtag Tweet Pete. If we choose your question and answer it on air, you win a free pizza courtesy of Papa John's. Now our question this week comes from at Matt Wellesley who asked, besides speed and agility, what makes Jamil Smith such an impact for the Ball State offense? Pat, Jamil was a guy that really frustrated a lot of uh, Indiana defenders. They just couldn't stop him. Yeah, well, first of all, speed and agility are a huge part of Jamil Smith's game and part of what makes him so good. But outside of those choices, I'm going to go with his elusiveness and most importantly, his ability to avoid contact. How often have you seen Jamil Smith take a huge hit in play? I can't remember one, and that's huge for him. He's the smallest player in Division I football. If he takes too many big hits, he's going to be on the sideline. He's going to be hurt. He knows exactly how to position and contort his body so that he doesn't take a big hit and allows him to stay on the field. I think a very overlooked 
overlooked aspect of Jamil's game is the fact that he was a former quarterback. I mean, so he understands the route tree. He understands what Keith is looking at. He understands the defenses and everything. So that's something that really takes Jamil's uh, game to the next level, being able to understand everything. If there's a hole in the defense, he can go back and say, hey, Keith, you know, we're seeing this. And Keith knows exactly what he's talking about because, you know, they've got that quarterback brain. You know, it's kind of like uh, telekinetic, if you will, that they know what each other's thinking. So I think that is a huge uh, aspect of Jamil's game. Thanks so much, at Matt Wellesy, for your uh, question. And remember, if you didn't get your question picked this week, you always got a chance next week. Just tweet a question, hashtag TweetPete, or at Third Down Chirp for another chance to win a free Papa John's pizza. All right, guys, it's prediction time. Now, I don't know if you guys know this. We've been keeping track of the predictions. Winner each week gets three points. Loser doesn't go home empty-handed. He gets one. Right now, you guys are all knotted up at seven. The pressure's on, Pat. Who you got? Well, this is a game that I think Ball State can win, but they're going to have to play near-perfect football to do that. I'm going to take South Florida winning this game. I'm going to take them 34-20. to I think this is a game where if Ball State plays really, really well, mistake-free football, that they could, in fact, pull out the victory. But I think, I'm not sure Ball State's quite there yet. I'm going to take South Florida in a game that the Cardinals are in the whole way. I think if Ball State limits their turnovers, and like I said, key to the game, creates turnovers, then they absolutely have a chance uh, to pull off the win over the Bulls. But I just think in the long run, I think South Florida is too athletic uh, just across the board. I think Daniels makes too many plays with his feet. I've got South Florida 37-31 in a close one throughout the whole thing. Well, it should be a great game regardless. It's going to be at home at Schumann Stadium, kickoff at 430. You can't make it out to the game, or even if you do, be sure to listen to the three of us on SportsLink Radio 91.3. WCRD and for the latest in Ball State sporting news and stories, be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Just search Ball State Sports Link. You can also watch all of our content on Fox College Sports, WIPB in Muncie, and locally in Comcast, Indiana. All right, guys, that's going to wrap up another exciting week of Third Down Chirp. Hopefully, we come back. We're talking about two wins in a row and a big win against South Florida. But until then, go Cardinals. I'm Chris Rankle. He's Pat Boylan. He's Timmy Fogarty. We'll see you next week. It's what we were talking about earlier. How do you stop B.J. Daniels? That's also the key to the game is stopping B.J. Daniels and getting pressure on him, but not needing the linebackers to do that. If the Ball State front four on defense. Timmy, <laughs> your analysis? Thank you, Pat, Timmy.